is the resistance report for October 16th, 2017, where we connect the dots, we try to show context, try to show you what's really getting, what's really happening, getting underneath the surface of uh, the, the news. And tonight we're, we're going to focus on what is really the biggest thing happening in Washington. I just got back from Washington a couple of days ago, and it is really like being in an enemy camp. Uh, not just the Republicans. I don't mean enemy in the sense of Republicans. I mean that there is a kind of a dark and menacing presence over Washington that has nothing to do with the American people. It has everything to do with the wealthiest and most powerful people in this country who are about to get what they really want. And that's what I want to talk about. It's Trump's tax plan and the Republican tax plan and how it relates to the battle that is simmering within the Republican Party right now. Now, today the Trump administration is ruling out an analysis. Here we go. Now, this analysis, if they call it an analysis, it supposedly shows that his tax plan would boost middle class incomes. Now, why do they say it's going to boost middle class incomes? Well, just wait for it. It's going to boost middle class incomes because corporations, according to this analysis, will pass their tax savings on to workers. Hello? When did that ever happen? Trump today promised that the average American family will get a $4,000 raise per year under the plan. Now, this is total unadulterated rubbish. Average workers are not going to get a raise because corporate taxes, when they are cut, go into the pockets of top executives, investors, and shareholders. We know that. That's what's always happened. And remember, the richest 10% of Americans owns 80% of all shares of stock. So when you raise the value of the stock market, which is already happening in anticipation of these tax cuts, you're really not helping most Americans. Shareholders are the people who pay, uh, really, the corporate income tax, and they benefit when the corporate income tax is cut. Now, bear with me here, because this is really important, uh, and you need to know to the, the lengths to which this administration is going to keep you and for the American people from knowing what's really happening. Uh, now. On the Treasury Department website, until very recently, there was a, an analysis. Uh, it was done in 2012, and it was from the Treasury's Office of Tax Analysis. Uh, professionals who look very carefully at how taxes affect people and who actually pays the taxes. This 2012 analysis found that shareholders pay actually 82% of the corporate tax, and workers pay only 18%. In other words, when corporations are taxed, I mean, here's a corporation, and you have a tax on the corporation. When you have a tax on the corporation, a corporate income tax, what happens is somebody, people pay taxes. Corporations don't pay taxes. Despite what the Supreme Court says, corporations are not people. People pay taxes. So the question is, when a corporation is taxed, what people actually pay the corporate income tax, and it turns out, not all that surprisingly, that the shareholders pay 80%, more than 80% of the corporate income tax. So when a corporate income tax is cut, the shareholders get a huge benefit. Workers get a tiny, pay a tiny bit of the corporation, uh, the income tax, in terms of their pay, it comes out of their pay, a little bit. Uh, so when the corporate income tax is cut, they get a little bit of benefit, but it's a little tiny benefit. So a big corporate tax cut will overwhelmingly help shareholders, who, as I said, are overwhelmingly in the top 10% of income. Uh, but a funny thing happened to this 2012 analysis. This is a sophisticated analysis, folks. Trump's Treasury Department yanked that analysis off the web page. It's gone. A Treasury spokeswoman says it does not represent our thinking and analysis. 
our thinking analysis. It's as if there is thinking, our thinking analysis, and then there is their thinking analysis. Uh, analysis, facts, logic, they don't vary with who is in power, should not vary with in power. There should not be alternative facts, alternative analysis, alternative logic. What we have here from the Treasury Department, from the Trump administration, from Donald Trump himself, are a stream of alternative facts made up to mask policies that will overwhelmingly benefit the rich, but which are pretending to be policies that will help middle class and Trump's working class voters. Now, according to the nonpartisan, I'm just, I'm going to give you this stuff, please, it's important. I know it, it, it may be a little bit dry, it's not. It's coming out of your paycheck, so it's not dry. According to the Nonpartisan Tax Policy Center, the wealthy would reap about half of all of the tax benefits in the tax plan. In 2018, the wealthiest 1% would take home a 129,000 tax cut. So next year, if this tax plan goes through, people who are at the top, they get $129,000 in tax cuts. That's a big, hefty tax cut if you're in the top 1%. But if you are in the center of the income spectrum, if you're just an average middle-class person or a working-class pe person, at most you would have a $660 tax cut. That's it. And you're not even really going to get a $660 tax cut because, be because there is going to be a huge, there are going to have to be huge spending cuts in Social Security and in Medicare and in Medicaid and every place else. So you in the middle or you a poor person, you are actually going to come out way, way behind and the people at the top are going to come out way, way ahead. I mean, it's no secret. Everybody knows it. Uh, by the way, you're going to hear a lot about the budget this coming few weeks. Uh, the thing is that in order to get a tax bill through the Senate. The Senate is going to have to pass a budget first because Congress is not able to advance a tax plan uh, just with Republican votes and it's not going to get Democratic votes until the budget passes both legislative chambers. That's called reconciliation. The only other option is to get a bipartisan tax bill passed but obviously Democrats are not going to eagerly sign on to this bill. But there's a larger point here that is important for you to understand. Trump and the Republican leadership in Washington want only one big thing. Let me just say this again. Trump and the Republican leadership in Washington want only one big thing. They want a huge tax cut for corporations and the wealthy, which are much the same thing. This is it, folks. This is the big deal. This is the center ring. This is why all the money came pouring into Washington in the first place, why all the lobbyists are in Washington. It's the main reason why they wanted to slash the Affordable Care Act and why Trump unilaterally has taken his own steps to undermine the, the Affordable Care Act in order to free up billions of dollars for the tax cut. It's why Republicans no longer talk about budget deficits or the national debt. You remember when they used to talk about, we used to have Republicans who were, who were debt scolds. They used to say, no, you can't do that because it would raise the national debt. You don't hear that. There's no Republican talking that way, at least publicly. And it's also the reason Trump is doing everything he can to deflect your attention, the public's attention, from this gigantic tax break for the rich. Not only with lies, such as I just related to you, but also with attacks, his attacks on transgender people, on NFL players who kneel, on the press, on women's reproductive rights, on gays. I mean, these, these are all important. I'm not suggesting they, they are not important. They are very important. But they are intended in a way to rile us up, to divide us, and to divert our attention from the really big issue here. And the really big issue is what's happening to taxes and the wealthy. Now, in an attempt to mend fences with Senate Republicans, Trump held a press conference today at the White House with Mitch McConnell. 
So here's Trump. And here is Mitch McConnell. Uh, now, the reset between Trump and Mitch McConnell comes just as the clock is ticking for Trump to push through these tax cuts. You've got to get the, the, the Senate is going to have to move very, very fast. Now, why are Trump and Republican leaders so dead set on a giant tax cut for corporations and the wealthy? It's not because it will lead to economic growth and create more jobs. Don't fall for that line. That is trickle-down economics. We have heard it for years. We know that it's just a lie. History proves it. George W. Bush's supply-side tax cuts, they didn't grow the economy. They didn't create jobs. Bill Clinton's and Barack Obama's tax increases did not slow the economy. No, Trump and the Republicans are committed to a tax cut for corporations and the wealthy because Their donors, their wealthy donors, demand it. At a Republican donor conclave held just last week by the Koch brothers, the party's wealthiest backers expressed anger at the Republican Congress for not already achieving a big tax cut. What are you doing? Why are you not getting this tax cut we paid for? It's why they bankrolled the entire election, and now... At this meeting, they have decided to bankroll an expensive campaign to push these tax cuts through. Uh, as today's Washington Post reports, uh, tax cuts would be the best Christmas gift imaginable for these deep-pocketed donors and the corporations they lead. Which gets to the oddity... ...of Steve Bannon. He looks a little bit like Trump, doesn't he? And Steve, Steve Bannon has been promoting primary challengers against Senate GOP incumbents. So here's McConnell, and here's Trump, and here's Bannon, and here are the Koch brothers. There are two of them, right? And many, many others behind them. So why? So Bannon uh, has been arguing that the Republican establishment has given up on the populist economic agenda that powered Trump's victory. And the Republican establishment, hello, they have betrayed Trump's agenda. But Trump himself, he never had an agenda. I mean, his only agenda was to amass more wealth and power and attention for himself. That's the Trump agenda. So, here is the bottom line. Trump is caught between his base, the, the, the Bannon base, the, the populist base that expects him to help working class Americans, and the Republican establishment. So, how does he, how does he do this? How does he get what the establishment wants, is, which is this big, big tax cut uh, that makes the wealthy even wealthier, but also do it in a way that doesn't look like he's just another establishment politician. Well, here's how he does it. He has it both ways. He tells his base that the massive tax cuts for the rich will benefit them, will benefit working class Americans. He lies. He and the Council of Economic Advisors and the Treasury Secretary, Mnuchin, and all of them are in a collective lie, an alternative factual universe, alternative facts, an alternative analysis, an alternative logic. Like today, announcing that average people are going to get a $4,000, they're going to be $4,000 richer starting next year because of that, this, this tax cut for the wealthy? My friends, we have entered a new era. 
of American politics. I mean, I was in the cabinet. I know every administration uses some degree of spin to sell their policy initiatives. They put it in the best policy, they, they put the, the initiatives in the best policy possible light. They, they tend to downplay the disadvantages and to, uh, to, to exaggerate a little bit the positives. But honestly, and I've worked in Republican as well as Democratic administrations, this, what we're seeing now, is completely different. We're, we're now seeing the elevation of absolute lies to the institutionalization of lying in the cabinet, in administration. I frankly worry. And it, my worry goes way beyond this policy issue of the, of, the, of the taxes. My worry is how can we maintain a democracy based on calculated lies? Well, I have a lot more to say on that, as I'm sure you do as well, but I want to take your questions. Uh, first of all, Brenna... Breeson Breithaupt? Uh, did I pronounce it correctly, Brennan? Uh, we put a lot of focus on Trump when in reality he isn't the one coming up with legislation. Who else do we need to hold accountable for the policies coming out under his presidency? Uh, Brenna, uh, these are the people who really are running things. I mean, Trump is, is mouthing off. He's the showman, the con man, uh, the, you know, the, the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus. Uh, leader. Uh, he taunts and he creates chaos, um, uh, but the real people who are running things are a relatively small handful of extraordinarily wealthy people uh, behind him and behind uh, key members of Congress. They are calling the shots. This tax plan reveals that. And that's why Trump is obviously a, not a real populist, he's a faux populist. I mean, the whole thing is a, people, people need to see through it. I think one of the most important things over the next year, particularly leading up to the midterms and then beyond to 2020, uh, uh, is that average working Americans, particularly Trump voters, uh, see what's actually, see what he is doing to them. See uh, the way in which Donald Trump is, is actually harming their lives. Um, and, uh, and feel it. Cindy Myers Harley, uh, Florida Governor Scott just authorized statewide resources to provide law enforcement at an event where Richard Spencer will be speaking at the University of Florida this weekend. What are your thoughts on this? Well, um, I have very strong feelings on the freedom of speech. I mean, I, I think Richard Spencer is a hateful, shameful man whose views are odious, but should he be allowed to speak? I think so. Uh, should uh, protesters be protected peacefully if they are peaceful protesters? Yes. Uh, and I think that universities and even uh, governors have got to pay, if necessary, to make sure that we continue to hold the freedom of speech as centrally in our society as, as we do, even for odious people. I mean, the advantage, quite frankly, of having people hear utterly nonsensical, odious remarks is that they can see them and hear them for themselves. They can think for themselves. Uh, instead of making a martyr out of Richard Spencer or anybody else who's, who can't speak, that's the danger. You just make, you, 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 you give them a dignity uh, that they shouldn't have if they're not, if they're not allowed to speak. Ajan Manorite, I have friends and family who say they were worried about the economy under Obama and were relieved that uh, money uh, under Trump, CNN says, the stock market is up 4,000 points. Uh, it was easy for me to stand up against the Republican health care bill, but I don't understand the stock market well enough to respond to this. Can you provide some context? Jan, the reason the stock market is up is that the stock market has already already calculated the benefits of a gigantic tax cut to corporations. And, as I said before, that means a tax cut for shareholders. So people at the top are going to get the lion's share of all of this. Just because the stock market is up doesn't mean people's wages go up. It doesn't mean there's any economic growth. In fact, there is no relationship between the stock market going up and the economy growing or the economy producing more jobs. 
And that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, Marie Rybin, is that right, Marie? In what way would Pence be better than Trump? Wouldn't the Freedom Caucus be re-empowered uh, if Pence were to become president? Marie, this is a good question. I've asked it, and I'm, I've, I've been asked it over and over again. If Trump is impeached, where he's thrown out under the 25th Amendment, uh, would Pence be any better? And on policy terms, uh, probably not. I mean, Pence is already making a lot of the policies for the Trump administration. As, as Trump tweets and, and goes through his tantrums, uh, Pence is probably as close as we have to any kind of center of policy making in the administration. But here's the thing. I would rather have a right winger who is somewhat predictable as a president than a pathological sociopath, a, a, a narcissist who is a kind of malignant narcissist, somebody who is dangerous. Um, and I think that describes Trump. Uh, and I'm serious about that. I, I think that, and I've heard it again and again, when I was in Washington just this, a few days ago, uh, I had a number of conversations with Republicans, people I knew and worked with uh, years ago, who are very worried about the mental capacities of our current president. Uh, they're worried on all kinds of grounds, but one of their central worries is obvious. You know, it's, it's, it's North Korea. It's the possibility of a kind of impulsive decision. And Trump makes decisions without consulting with anybody. So it's the lesser of two evils. I think Pence is the lesser of two evils. Uh, and finally, Beth Witsey, lobbying forms a part of every legislative decision. Money is where the power lies at the heart of the United States government. What is the solution to outsized lobbying power? Well, Beth, there are solutions to outsized lobbying power. Um, but we have got to be able to get the legislation necessary to break the iron grip of lobbyists. In other words, we, we can have campaign finance reform, uh, even with Citizens United. Uh, we can have a, a kind of uh, a matching funds for small donations for campaigns. Uh, we can have a, a law that requires full disclosure of where all campaign contributions come from. Uh, there could be a law that, that slowed the revolving door between the insiders and the outsiders and who is regulated and who are the regulators. Uh, there are a lot of things that we could do. There are a lot of things we have done historically that have, have, have simply been repealed over the years. Uh, the, 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 the key to it is to have enough of a mass movement for democracy uh, to regain our de and reclaim our democracy, to have enough of a mass movement that we can actually force our politicians, both Republicans and Democrats, to make these changes, to make these reforms. So your actions, your grassroots activities, your engagement, your mobilization, your energy, they are critically, critically important. I say this, I know, all the time, and I want to thank you for those of you who are out there working hard, and there are millions of you. Uh, y your work is, I can't tell you how important it is. If you care about our democracy, you care about our democratic system of government, you care about our constitution, uh, you care about your children and their children, uh, you're going to be active. You're going to take your role as citizens enormously seriously. It's not just voting. It's not just paying your taxes. It's not just showing up for jury duty. It's active engagement. An hour a day, if you can. Two hours a week, three hours, four hours. It doesn't matter. Your engagement and also linking up with others in various grassroots groups, that is what is important. Please keep it up. Please do your best. We're counting on you. That's it for tonight. I want to I want to thank Sasha Lightman and also Andrew Santana for their enormous help. And I'll see you next time.